Let's pray. God, once again, uh, we come to you humbly asking that you would meet with us in this moment. We thank you, God, for the privilege it is to sing praise and worship to you, which the psalmist tells us is what we were created to do. And now, God, we ask that you would speak to us. Uh, God, I don't take lightly the, the responsibility to open your word and talk about it. And so I pray that you would just remove me from the equation and that you would speak through me. I pray, God, that the truth and the beauty and the conviction and the hope of your gospel would be communicated in all its wonder and beauty in this moment. We thank you for this season of Advent. We thank you, God, for what it reminds us of and what it points us toward. It reminds us that you came once and it re- points us toward your second coming. God, ask, we ask that you would give us the strength, the endurance, and the courage to, to run well the race that you have put before us until you call us home or until you come again. Speak to our hearts in this moment, God. Do what only you can do. We pray it in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. You can be seated. I heard one clap. You can if you want. You don't have to if you don't want to. Always a little bit of like an awkward moment. Are we supposed to clap for this guy? No. All right. Good morning once again. So good to be with you. Uh, doesn't, the church, doesn't the church look beautiful? That's, that's a huge thank you to our staff who were here this week and decorated. Uh, the poinsettias in particular, though this stack is going to cramp my preaching spot a little bit. And so I've, I'm having visions of me toppling over and down the stairs. I won't, it won't happen, no. Uh, we are taking a, we're going to pause Mark for the Christmas season, and we're going to look at some traditional Christmas texts for the season of Advent. So we're in Luke today. Uh, we're in Luke chapter 1. We're going to start in verse 26. Luke 1, 26 through 38, 38. I'll give you two seconds to get there. It'll be up on the screen uh, if you don't have a device or a paper Bible. This is what it says. It says, in the sixth month, that is the sixth month of Elizabeth's pregnancy, in the sixth month, the angel Gabriel was sent from God to a city of Galilee named Nazareth, to a virgin betrothed to a man whose name was Joseph of the house of David. And the virgin's name was Mary. And he came to her and said, Greetings, O favored one. The Lord is with you. But she was greatly troubled at the saying and tried to discern what sort of greeting this might be. And the angel said to her, Do not be afraid, Mary, for you have found favor with God. And behold, you will conceive in your womb and bear a son, and you shall call his name Jesus. He will be great and will be called Son of the Most High. And the Lord God will give to him the throne of his father David, and he will reign over the house of Jacob forever, and of his kingdom there will be no end. And Mary said to the angel, how will this be since I am a virgin? And the angel answered her, the Holy Spirit will come upon you, and the power of the Most High will overshadow you. Therefore, the child to be born will be called Holy, the Son of God. And behold, your relative Elizabeth in her old age has also conceived a son. And this is the sixth month with her who was called barren. For nothing will be impossible with God. And Mary said, behold, I am the servant of the Lord. Let it be to me according to your word. And the angel departed from her. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Every spring in this country, thousands upon thousands, hundreds of thousands upon hundreds of thousands, probably millions upon millions of uh, late stage teenagers come home from school and head to the mailbox with great anticipation. Small envelope, maybe not good news. Big packet, possibly good news. At least that's the way it was when I did it. And that was 21 years ago, I think. Maybe it's email now, I don't know. Regardless, whether it's physical mail, email, each spring, lots of seniors in high school are checking their inbox or their mailbox with a lot of anticipation because they want to know whether they have been deemed worthy. They want to know whether they are wanted. They want to find out whether they have been accepted. Now, for some, 
Just to be accepted anywhere is a win. And that is awesome. Blessings on us. Others are shooting maybe a little bit higher and still some are shooting for the stars. Because while there are some colleges and universities in this country that accept up to 80, 90, or even 100% of the people who apply to them, there are other schools that are a little bit more selective. There are other schools on the opposite end of that spectrum which accept only 5 or 10% of the students that apply to them. These are the schools where a 3.95 GPA and a 1450 on your SATs does not set you apart. That's just the baseline for competing. I'm giving some people PTSD right now. It's okay. It's okay. You're through it. It's over. Some of you. Some of the kids, not so much. We have a family of five schools in this country that are amongst five of the most selective educational institutions in all of the world, and those are our military academies. You have the opportunity, should you be accepted into one of our military academies, to get a free education and a guaranteed job upon graduation. But unlike most of the schools that you're going to apply to, you have to go through a few more hoops to get into one of our military academies. You have to have a recommendation from a member of Congress. I remember hearing that when I was in high school, and I was like, how do you even do that? Like, uh, this is Gary calling for Mrs. Pelosi. I'm sorry, who? You have to take a, a, a mental health exam. You have to take a physical health exam. And for some of those schools, you actually have to pass a physical fitness test. Can you imagine, you know, Stanford being like, we'd love for you to come, but we've got to make sure you can run a mile in six minutes or less. That's the way it works at the military academies. That being said, uh, well, in 2019, 42,000 students applied to the five U.S. military academies, vying for about 4,000 spots. If you come home your senior year in college and find an acceptance letter from one of the U.S. military academies waiting for you in your mailbox or in your inbox, it is really the honor of your life up to that point. It is, a, it is a complete affirmation that you are one of the best, brightest, that you are completely worthy, and that you are wanted. It is a high, high honor to be accepted to West Point or Annapolis or Colorado Springs. I don't know where the other two are. But there's a huge tension if you are to receive that acceptance. Because acceptance into one of the U.S. military academies, while it is one of the highest honors you will probably have received up to that point in your young life, it is not an invitation to ease and comfort. It is an invitation to suffer. It is an invitation to hardship. And so there's this incredible tension if you get into one of those schools where, wow, this is amazing, and wow, this is going to be really hard. Because if you go to one of those schools, while all of your friends from high school are out on a Friday night partying, or a Thursday night, or a Monday night, you're being held to a curfew. While their restrictions on their life are being loosened, yours are being tightened. While they're sleeping in on a Saturday or a Sunday, or a Monday or a Tuesday, you're up at 6 a.m. for physical training. When they graduate and they get a job in a cubicle that has air conditioning, you may be going to the battlefield. So if I were the person writing the acceptance letters to those who have been accepted into our U.S. military academies, the line I would start with in that letter would not be congratulations. The line I would start with would be, now comes the hard part. And while very few of us in this room, I know there are actually, I know of at least one, I don't think he's here today, who has actually received that letter. Whether you went to college, whether you didn't go to college, what your college experience was like, that's not the point I'm trying to make because I think we can all identify with the emotions wrapped up in the application process to a place like one of the U.S. military academies. Because inside all of us, there is a longing to feel like we are accepted. There is a longing inside all of us to feel like we are special, like we are set apart, like we deserve something, like we have earned something. We all want to feel that call. We all want to feel like we've been chosen, that we have been, that we've done something worthwhile and somebody else wants us. 
especially in a place like the Bay Area. I've lived a lot of places in my short life, and I have never felt so much the dichotomy as you feel here between those who are set apart and have succeeded and those who have not. Every day, we just get bombarded in this place by, are you good enough? Are you worthy? And here's the good news. We all are worthy in God's eyes. Maybe not in West Point's eyes, maybe not in Stanford's eyes, maybe not in Berkeley's eyes, Maybe not in the Bay Area's eyes, but in God's eyes, every single one of us is wanted. Every single one of us is chosen. Every single one of us is worthy. But to receive that acceptance from God is just like receiving an acceptance letter from one of the U.S. military academies. Because yes, it is the highest honor of our lives to know that God loves us and wants us and calls us as his children. But now comes the hard part. And that is exactly what we see in this text that we are looking at with Gabriel's announcement to Mary. We're in the season of Advent. Advent is a Latin word that that means arrival or coming. And in this season, we are remembering, as I said it in my prayer, that Jesus Christ, the God man himself, came to earth in flesh, did for us what we could not do, and we are also looking forward to the time that he is going to come back again. But what I want us to recognize as we look at these 12 or so verses that we're looking at today. In my Bible, it's titled, I think, The the Birth of Jesus Foretold, something like that. Yeah, The Birth of Jesus Foretold. What this really is, is a call. Those little titles in the ESV Bible, they're not inspired by God. I would have called it The Call of Mary because we don't have time today to look at the parallels, but there are incredibly close parallels between this Uh, what happens to Mary and what happened to Moses and Gideon and Jeremiah in the Old Testament. This is an announcement of the birth of Jesus that is gonna come, but it is more than that. It is a call on Mary's life. Gabriel is delivering to Mary in this text her letter of acceptance. And what we are going to see as we read through these verses together is that he brings both sides of the equation. He brings the congratulations, but he also lets her know now comes the hard part. So with that, there's a few things I want us to draw out of this text. And the first one is this. God chooses unlikely people. God chooses unlikely people. So come back with me to verse 26 and 27. It says, in the sixth month, the angel Gabriel was sent from God to a city of Galilee named Nazareth to a virgin betrothed to a man whose name was Joseph of the house of David and the virgin's name was Mary. So a couple of things just really quickly I want us to draw out of this. Here's the angel Gabriel. He's sent to Nazareth to meet with this girl named Mary. But look at what Luke says about Nazareth. He qualifies it. A city of Galilee named Nazareth. Why does he have to qualify Nazareth? Why does he have to tell his readers it was a city in Galilee? Because if he didn't, they wouldn't have known where it was. They wouldn't have known. it. Nazareth was a small town in the middle of nowhere that did not even register on a map. If you pulled it up on Apple Maps or Google Maps, you'd have to do this like 10 times for, to get Nazareth to actually show up. Uh, it, it doesn't, the, Nazareth is not talked about at all in the Old Testament. It's talked about about 12 times in the New Testament, all in connection with Jesus. Never in any of the extra biblical literature that we have is Nazareth mentioned from that time. The first mention of Nazareth in something outside of the Bible comes 200 years after the birth of Christ. It is a nowhere town. Verse 27, it says, Gabriel was sent to a virgin betrothed to a man whose name was Joseph. Let's talk about this word betrothed just for two seconds. That is the same idea today as what we call engaged. She was engaged to Joseph, but it was way more binding back then. The dowry had already been exchanged. They were already considered husband and wife. It wasn't, they weren't living together yet. It wasn't consummated until the the wedding, but you couldn't just walk away from an engagement. It actually had to be broken by a divorce. And what's important about us knowing that she was betrothed is this. The average age for betrothal at this time in the ancient Near East, in Palestine, at the, the turn of, you know, going from the BCs to the ADs, 12 to 14 years old. So this is not 18 year old Mary. This is not 21 or 25-year-old Mary who's a career woman and got her life. This is maybe middle school-aged Mary. I have a 12-year-old daughter. I cannot fathom what is happening in this passage happening with her. So so the angel Gabriel shows up to a backwater, no-name place that nobody has ever heard of, and he meets with a preteen or barely teenage girl, and what does he tell her? 
He says, God chooses you. God has chosen you. Look with me at verse 28. And he came to her and said, greetings, O favored one. The Lord is with you. Then skip down with me to 30. And the angel said to her, do not be afraid, Mary, for you have found favor with God. See that word favor shows up twice? It's not the same word in Greek, but both of those words in Greek come from the same root, which means grace. The angel is telling Mary, you have found grace in God's eyes. Now, we just got to hang out here for two minutes, take a little detour to help us understand what this actually means for Mary. That phrase in verse 30, Mary, you have found favor with God. We see that exact phrase somewhere else, way, way back in the Old Testament in Genesis chapter 6. Genesis chapter 6 opens up and we're told that, that man has become so sinful that God is grieved in his heart that he made man and he is going to wipe them off the face of the earth. But in Genesis 6, 8, do you remember what it says? It says, a man named Noah found favor in the eyes of the Lord. Noah found grace with God. Now, I gotta, I gotta mess with your understanding of grace here for a second, okay? So hang with me. How do most children's Bibles, I'm gonna give this side a little opportunity. How do most children's Bibles tell the story of Noah? How do they start the story of Noah? Noah was a good man. Noah was a righteous man. And I can still see the picture in my mind of the picture on the page. Noah is praying and there's someone killing someone else behind him on this side. There's someone stealing something out of a house on this side. Someone drinking, you know, not apple juice on this side. That's because in Genesis 6, 9, it says that Noah was a righteous man and blameless before God. But here's what we need to know. Genesis, we believe, was written by Moses centuries after Noah lived. Genesis 6, 9 is a summary statement of his life. So here's the deal. It is possible that Noah was the only one on earth who had a quiet time every morning and who prayed and didn't use foul language and didn't steal from his neighbors. Possible. But it's also possible, and in fact, I would say it's likely that Noah was just as sinful and evil and decrepit as everybody else because that is what grace is. Grace is not something we earn. And we want the story of Noah to be that he was righteous and that's why God saved him. But that's not the story of grace. The story of grace is that God chooses unlikely people who don't deserve it. And for reasons we may never know, this side of eternity says you are mine and I'm gonna do something with you or through you. So when we get to this passage in Luke chapter one, and it says that Mary found favor in God's eyes. What we have to understand is that it could mean this, but it probably doesn't mean that Mary had quiet times every morning and was super devout and God saw something in her that was better than everybody else and so that's why he chose her. Now, I'm not saying Mary was you know, smoking dope behind the dumpster at lunch and I'm not saying she was that either. But the point of the passage is that God chooses people who don't seem to have anything to offer him. God chooses unlikely people and he says, I want you. Unless you think that is an anomaly, just it was Noah and Mary, that is the story of all of scripture. Abraham, he was a pagan idol worshiper. Didn't even know who God was. And God shows up out of nowhere and says, I'm gonna make you the father of my people. Abraham's grandson, Jacob. Jacob is a lying cheater. He's awful. You know the story of how he takes his brother's birthright. And then in the very next chapter, God meets with him and tells him, I am going to bless the world through your offspring. And you're like, no, 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 no. That shouldn't be how it works. But God chooses unlikely people. Moses, he was a murderer and a liar who was afraid to be in front of people. And God says, you're going to lead my people out of Egypt. David, he was a, probably like Mary, like a preteen shepherd, the youngest of his brothers from the smallest tribe in Israel. And God shows up and he says, I choose you. You are gonna be the king over my people. The disciples, they were a ragtag group of knuckleheads. <laughs> Fishermen, social deviants, social outcasts. And Jesus is like, you're my guys. I choose you, and he turned the world upside down through them. The apostle Paul started off as Saul, 
And we got to remember, when we think about Paul, and I'm, I'm, I'm belaboring this point, and I'm going to wrap it up. When we think about the Apostle Paul, what you need to have come into your mind when you think about a passage like 1 Corinthians 13, where he says, love is patient, kind, does not envy, does not boast. Paul was an ISIS-level terrorist. Yeah, yeah. He was killing God's people as like his main goal in life. And God looks at him and he's like, I can use you. Because God chooses unlikely people. And can we just praise him for that? Because he is still doing. He is still doing the very same thing today. And this room and this live stream is full of people who can testify to that. I cannot help but think of Henry's blessed testimony last week. Where he's like, I have been to the county jail a hundred times. Not as a visitor. This may not surprise you, but I've never been to jail. I think we can all agree I would not do well in jail. But it doesn't matter because the ground is level at the foot of the cross. And God chooses, God chooses unlikely people and he calls them to himself and he calls them into service for himself. Listen, um, life has a way of beating us down. Our, our past has a way of just kind of hanging out way closer behind us than we would like it to. The, this world and, and our own selves are, are whispering to us all the time, you are not worthy. You are not good enough. You are not smart enough. You are not the best. You are not the brightest. You are not spiritual enough. And listen to me, I am not here to stroke your ego this morning. That is all true. It's true. And it doesn't matter because God doesn't care. Because in God's eyes, you are good enough and you are worthy and you are special. And he takes people like you and me who deserve nothing, who've done nothing to earn. The scripture tells us we are in open rebellion against him. And God says, I choose you. I can use you. Because God chooses unlikely people. All right, that's the first thing. Second thing I want us to draw out of this passage, second thing I want us to learn from this passage is that God chooses unlikely people to do hard things. It's kind of like the good news and now here's the catch. God chooses unlikely people and he chooses them to do hard things. So look at what Gabriel says to Mary, verse 31. He says, behold, you will conceive in your womb and you will bear a son and you shall call his name Jesus. Now, if we're Mary, we're like at this point, probably like, okay, this is, I can, I can handle this. I'm engaged. Uh, the highest calling for a woman at that time was to have children. And so, so this is like, she's like, I wanted, always wanted to be a mother. This is great. The angel goes on to describe what Jesus is gonna be in verses 33 and 30, uh, 32 and 33. And it becomes clear that this is not gonna be an ordinary child. And then in verse 34, it's like the, the light bulb is starting to go off for Mary. That, that maybe this is not gonna actually involve Joseph. And she says in verse 34, Mary said to the angel, how will this be? since I am a virgin. The, the mechanics of childbirth or childbearing or becoming pregnant uh, have not happened yet. God, how, or Gabriel, angel, what, what does this mean? And in this moment, what she is realizing is that rather than this being kind of like, hey, you and Joseph are gonna have a great little family, that this is gonna be way harder than she expected. We just have to understand very quickly kind of the cultural and relational implications of what Gabriel is telling Mary in this moment. At that time, to have a baby before you were married, like it was virtually unheard of. It just, it never happened for a bunch of reasons that we don't have time to, to dig into. It didn't happen. Um, if, if this is true, if what the angel is telling her is true and she is to become pregnant before she and Joseph are actually married, there's every likelihood that he is gonna divorce her. The Mosaic law actually allowed for someone in this situation to be killed. Now, we don't know that that was actually enforced like across the board at that time, but it's on the table. And even if neither of those things happened to her, which we have, you know, we know the rest of the story, they don't. Even if neither of those things happened to her, there is no question that she is going to face unbelievable criticism, ostracization, is that a word, ostracization? She's gonna be ostracized. <laughs> She's gonna be shamed. Her family's gonna, gonna take shame. It is gonna be really ugly. And we actually, again, know the rest of the story, and she was. For the rest of his life, people whispered about Jesus that he was an illegitimate child. And it's not like for Mary, 
that she's just like, hey, if I can just get through this pregnancy and, and have this baby that's gonna be called Jesus, then things are gonna, you know, then we, then we move on. Like, it wasn't smooth sailing for the rest of her life. We don't know it for a fact, but we believe from other passages in scripture that Joseph died relatively early. And she was a single mom to a, to a bunch of children. Whether or not that happened, we do know for a fact that 33 years later, she watched this baby, her firstborn, be nailed to a cross as a murderer. God chooses unlikely people, but he chooses them to do hard things. And we got to hold those two things in tension. This is why I started with the, the whole deal about the military academies. Because it's like, this is a high honor for God to call you and choose you. But it's, now's the hard part. And kids, for you, those of you who are here, most of us, the opportunity to be accepted to a military academy, that ship sailed many years ago. If you're here and you're a child, if you work hard and become friends with a senator, <laughs> you too could be accepted into one of the U.S. military academies. And so even though many of us will never have that experience, we all have experiences like this in our own lives. We all have things that we look forward to and think about and we're like, I just want that. And if I just had that, that would be great but then it ends up being a lot harder than you thought. Before I went into ministry, when I was in the, 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 the private sector, when I was working in, in the business world, uh, I spent 10 years at a company and there was a job there that I was like, that is the job I want. And after several years, I was offered that job. And it was an amazing affirmation and, and you know, shot to my ego and it was a great promotion. And then I started doing the job and I was like, this is actually really hard. Like the... The, the stress and the expectations and the politics, it was more work to keep the job than it was to get the job. And we could, we could extrapolate that out over all kinds of experiences in life. God chooses unlikely people and he chooses unlikely people to do hard things. That is the experience of discipleship. That is the lived experience of following Jesus Christ is God calls us to do hard things. That was Mary's experience. Can you imagine Mary in the days and weeks after this encounter? Just sitting there quietly being like, really? This is really what I'm gonna do? This is really what God wants me to do? Because think of the cognitive dissonance of like the God who says, you know, have children in, in a marriage, one man, one woman, wants me to become pregnant before I'm even married. Like, God, are, are you serious? And how many of us have walked through similar experiences of cognitive dissonance with what we think we know about God and what he actually calls us to do. God, like, really? You want me to stay in this marriage even though it's just a train wreck and it's, it's crushing me and, and all I want to do is get out? Like, really, you want me to stay in this job where these people are just so foul and so against you and so hard on me? Like, really, this is where you want me to be? You want me to stay in the bay? Even though it makes no sense financially, relationally, emotionally, whatever other Lee you can come up with? <laughs> you want me to leave? Really, God? You want me to go somewhere else even though this is all I've ever known and my family's here and my job's here and you really want me to, to do that? For the, the young ones here, God, you want me to change schools again? Because my parents keep moving me? Really? You want me to leave my friends? You, God, you want me to, to get bullied at school because people know I'm a Christian? Because people know I don't drink and I don't use bad words and they just give me a hard time. Really, that's what you want? It's really easy as followers of Jesus to start to be like, and I know it firsthand, like why does everyone else get the good stuff? And God, this is what you're giving me. And I know that this has been like a theme over a bunch of sermons and I'm just trying to preach what I think is God is saying, but God does not call us so that he can give us the easy, comfortable, safe, predictable life that we think that we want. God chooses us and he calls us and he takes us through hard things. And some of those, we may know this side of eternity why he did it, but some of them we, we may not. It may not be until we meet him face to face that we understand some of the stuff that he has brought us through. But what we gotta learn, because it's the, it is the story of Mary, you know, it's so easy to be like, hail Mary full of grace. First of all, she wasn't full of grace. She was given grace. But it is so easy to be like, what an amazing life. Like she got to have Jesus Christ. She got to be the mother of God. And in reality, it was hard. It was really hard. There was a cost. God chooses unlikely people and he chooses them. He calls them to do hard things. And the last thing, the last thing, and this is, this is the good part, is that God is with us through it all. 
God is with us through it all. We sang earlier about Emmanuel. And what we need to see, what I want us to recognize in these few short verses where the birth of Jesus is being foretold is that Mary had Emmanuel before Jesus even showed up on the scene. Look again back with me at uh, verse 28. Gabriel says to Mary, he came to her and said, greetings, O favored one. What? The Lord is with you. That is not a statement of hope. That is not may the Lord be with you. You know, may the force be with you. That is a declaration of fact. Mary, the Lord is with you. And then when Mary says, how is this gonna happen? Skip with me down to verse 35. The angel answered her, the Holy Spirit will come upon you and the power of the Most High will overshadow you. Therefore, the child to be born will be called holy. Listen, that is not only describing how the conception is going to take place. That is describing the state of Mary's life from that moment forward. She is going to be filled with the Holy Spirit and God's power is going to overshadow her. Does that remind you of anything? Reminds me of another overshadowing, also in the Old Testament. When God called his people, when God saved his children, the Israelites out of slavery in Egypt, how did he lead them for 40 years through the desert by a cloud? I know it was fire at night. It was cloud during the day. The glory cloud of God hovered over his people for 40 years, guiding them, guarding them, protecting them, providing for them. And Gabriel is saying in this moment, the same thing that God did for your ancestors, he is going to do for you, Mary. He is going to fill you with his spirit and he is going to be a cloud of power around you, guiding you, guarding you, protecting you, and leading you. Gabriel is saying, yeah, this is going to be hard, but you need to know that you are not going it alone. God is with you and he will be. And what was true for Mary is true for every single one of us who has bowed our knee to Jesus Christ and said, you are my Lord and Savior. When we decide that God is who he says he is, that Jesus is who he says he is, that Jesus did what the Bible says that he did, when we say, I cannot do it myself, I need you to do it for me, God. In that moment, we are filled with God's spirit and his power surrounds us. And so we need to know, someone needs to hear this morning, whatever the hard thing is that God is taking you through in this moment, you are not alone. Isaiah 43, when you pass through the flood, I'm with you. When you pass through the fire, I am with you. He will never leave us or forsake us. If he is for us, who can be against us? He is our dwelling place. We will never know this side of eternity the ways that God has protected us and guided us and guarded for us that we don't, we, we don't, we don't even recognize. Can I let you in on a little secret? Life is hard for everyone. Everyone's gonna go through junk. How much better to go through it with God at our side? So, so can I stay in this marriage that just seems like it is a train wreck? This is hypothetical, I'm not saying it literally for me. <laughs> On my own? Probably not. With God's spirit inside of me and his power surrounding me? Yes. Can I stay in this job that is just crushing me and just robbing me of my soul? On my own? No. With God's spirit inside of me and his power around me? Yes. Now, God calls people to change jobs. I'm not saying, like, understand the, the, the spirit in what I say, which I say that. Can I go to another new school? Can I make a new round of friends? Can I, can I deal with the being made fun of again on my own? Maybe not. But with God's spirit inside of me and his power around me? Absolutely. Amen. Can I make this move? Can I go to this new place? Can I, can, I, can I blow things up because I think it's what God is calling me to do? On my own, maybe not. But with his spirit inside of me and his power around me, absolutely yes. Can I face this illness? Can I face this cancer again? 
on my own, maybe not. With God's spirit inside of me and his power around me, I can do it. Because he is with us through it all. And he can do what we can. Uh, So as we finish up, I want to give the uh, worship team an opportunity to start making their way to the stage. Um, I just want to point out one more thing about this passage. The evidence that what Gabriel said is true is found right here in the passage. He says you're going to be filled with the Spirit and you're going to have God's power around you. God is with you. And in verse 38, in response to all of this craziness that this angel has just told her, what does Mary say? 12-year-old Mary, 13-year-old Mary, behold, I am the servant of the Lord. Let it be to me according to your word. What does she say? I'll do it. I'll do it. I'll do it. Did she say that because she was just so spiritual and she just was so powerful and she just, in and of herself, she found the courage to do it? Not a chance. She, the only way someone can speak like that is because of the spirit of God working in them and the power of God surrounding them to allow them to face something that otherwise they couldn't have faced. Uh, my, favorite, my favorite set of commercials right now, I think they're the greatest commercials of all time, are the Geico commercials, we help people not be like their parents. <laughs> and for all of you kids in here, I have experienced it myself, and we got a ton of people in here who, who will testify to this. There are all kinds of things that your parents say right now that you're like, I'm not going to be like that when I grow up. And then you're going to grow up, and one day you're going to say something, and you're going to say, that's exactly what my dad would have said. Yeah, someone's, someone's clapping, or that's exactly what my mom would have said. And what I love about God's word is it is like it speaks to our lived experience, because here's Mary, 13 years old, her life is about to be blown up and she says, I'm your servant. Let it be to me according to your word. We don't get a lot about Jesus in the interim from when he was born to when his public ministry starts. But we do know, we get some snippets and we know that it wasn't like a secret to him that he was God's son and that that Joseph wasn't his biological father. And I just imagine sometimes uh, the, the Jesus and Mary sitting around, maybe at his birthday, sitting around the Christmas tree. Just kidding. That wasn't Christmas tree for Jesus' birthday. And Mary sharing with Jesus the story of how the angel Gabriel came and visited her and what that conversation went like. And Jesus being like, oh, tell Gabriel I say hi. It's been a while. No. <laughs> and and, and she, she, Jesus being like, how did you respond? And, and Mary saying, I said, I'll do it. I'm the servant of the Lord. Let it be to me according to your word. And I love that because 33 years later, here's her son in a garden the night before he knows he is to go to the cross. God is about to take him through the hardest thing. He's been chosen. He's been called. Now comes the hard part. And in that garden, the night before he goes to the cross, Jesus says what? If it's possible, God, take this cup from me. I don't want to do this. And can I paraphrase? Then he says, I'm your servant. Let it be to me according to your word. It says, if it's possible, take this cup from me, but not my will, but yours be done. And because Jesus went to the cross, because he died in our place, we all can have the same experience that Mary had of being filled with God's Holy Spirit and his power surrounding us because the relationship that was broken has been restored because Jesus paid the price that we could never pray. Hey, And so as we sit in this season of Advent, as we move towards Christmas, whatever it is that God is bringing us through right now, my hope and my prayer is that each of us, along with Mary and along with Jesus, might be able to say whatever this hard thing is, God, I am your servant. Let it be to me according to your word. God chooses unlikely people. He chooses unlikely people to do hard things, but he is with us through it all. Let's pray. God, we thank you uh, once again that you have done for us what we couldn't do for ourselves. We thank you, God, for the incredible privilege it is to be called your sons and your daughters, something that we could not earn, something we did not deserve, and yet in your incredible love, kindness, and in your grace, you look at us and you say, "I, I choose you. 
And yet, God, we know that that is not the, the pathway to ease and prosperity. That it is the pathway to joy and hope and fulfillment, but it also comes with some hard things. And so, God, I pray for someone today who's walking through a hard thing, that they would know you are with them, that they would feel your presence, and that you would give them a strength by your indwelling spirit that they do not have on their own. Thank you for who you are and for what you have done. We pray it all in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. We're now gonna transition uh, into communion. Uh, hopefully you have the prepackaged elements. And let me just um, preface it by saying this. Uh, the scripture is clear that um, communion is for those who have made Jesus Christ Lord and Savior of their lives. So if that's not you, if you would not say, Jesus is my king, uh, I would invite you just not to participate in communion with us today. But if that is you, there is no better moment than right now to make the decision to follow Jesus Christ with your life and myself or any one of our elders or ministry leaders would love to talk to you about what that means. We're gonna take a few moments while the worship team leads us just for a, a, a short moment in worship to prepare our hearts and then I'll lead us in taking communion together. The Father's arms are open wide. Forgiveness was bought with the precious blood of Jesus Christ. Come to the altar. The Father's arms are open. Before we take the elements, my understanding is that we ran out uh, at the beginning of service and we have found extra elements. So if you are here and you did not get the communion elements and you would like them, would you just put your hand up really quickly so that we can get them to you? Great, all right, I think we're good. Please stand. If you'll take the bread. For I received from the Lord what I also delivered to you, that the Lord Jesus on the night when he was betrayed took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, this is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Take and eat. Hallelujah. And now the cup. In the same way also he took the cup after supper, saying, this cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink the cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Take and drink. Thank you, Lord. Amen. We're gonna sing a song of response now, and then I'll be back up uh, to lead us in the benediction.
just a reminder, uh, we'll be here at seven o'clock on Tuesday night to pray. Receive the benediction. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious unto you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. Until we meet again or until our Savior comes and then forever. Amen. You're loved and you're prayed for and you're sent.